The year is 480 <clears throat> BC. The Persians have mounted an army of 300,000 men, the largest in history up till that time. It's a size army that the Romans would later use to dominate the entire Mediterranean. The leader of the Persians, Xerxes, a man of such stature during his time that even people of other nations referred to him simply as the king, had decided to launch the full fury of this force against a single city, Athens. The situation in Athens was serious. The Athenians figured that if anyone could come up with a solution to this particular problem, though, it may well be them. They were, after all, renowned for their ingenuity and their rational intellects. They had recently invented democracy and tragedy, and within a decade would see the birth of Socrates and philosophy as we know it. So they did what any rational people would do in such a situation. They deliberated. They gathered information. They used rules of logic to draw inferences. They put, uh, they uh, used public debate to test their conclusions. And with careful arguments, they considered their courses of action. After grinding away at it, they did what any rational group of people would do at that time. They sent away for an oracle. <laughs> the Pythia was the most authoritative oracle of the day. She was an aging, frail, illiterate woman housed in a massive stone temple at Delphi. She took questions from her petitioners, and she dispensed answers in the form of riddles. The Athenian answer was grim. But there was one small glimmer of hope. The Pythia said that only a wooden wall will remain unconquered. The embassy took this riddle back to their city, and a debate which had been meandering in many different directions quickly crystallized around two potential options either hole up in the traditional stronghold of the Acropolis, which had been surrounded by a wooden fence, or use wood to build a navy to take on Xerxes at sea and cut off his supply lines. The second course of action prevailed, and Athens survived and thrived. Now, we might wonder, why did they do this? Why did they rely on an oracle? Why did they imagine, especially this group of people that was an emblem for rational thinking, why did they imagine that a person with no knowledge base could provide any pertinent insight into their situation? And this was no aberration. The Greeks were in the habit of turning to oracles and also used many other techniques when they ran up to the limits of their own rational thinking. They were interested in the instinctual behaviors of animals like the flight paths and screeches of birds. They were interested in their dreams and they spent time examining the pulsating entrails of the animals they sacrificed to their gods. They called it the study of divine signs or divination. Seems like strange behavior, yes? Well, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try to persuade, to you, persuade you of two things. Number one, it wasn't strange. And number two, you still do it. <laughs> my field is classics, the study of Greece and Rome. And when scholars in my discipline take on this question, they typically pull out two kinds of answers. Number one comes from a vantage of social history. It's imagined that what we have is some an elite group that has a strategy, and they use the ostentatious mystery of divine signs in order to persuade the masses to come their way. They form consensus, and they manage to dissent. But there's a problem for this idea. The problem is that most situations of divination, despite our example, were not relevant to politics. Most had to do with matters of personal and even intimate concern. Should I be involved with a business, in a business deal with this person? Should I take a trip on this day? Should I marry this man? These things have nothing to do with the dynamic between the elite and the masses. There's a further problem, which is according to all the evidence that we have, even in situations of politics, the elites thought it worked just as much as the masses did. So if the elites were pulling the wool over anyone's eyes, they were pulling the wool over their own eyes as well. It doesn't quite hold up. Another kind of explanation comes out, and it starts from the idea of superstition. We're told that primitive brains are superstitious, and the corollary is that ours aren't. And they're prone to exotic theological commitments, and so they believe in strange things. But there's a problem with this line of thinking as well. While it may well be a part of the uh, behavior of divination, it doesn't necessarily explain the behavior of divination. It's not, it, while superstition may have something to do with it, it doesn't necessarily lead 
to the behaviors that we see in divination. It's not as though when there's sufficient amount of superstition in the air, all of a sudden people think that the universe is coursing with hidden messages that are readable by these techniques. A final kind of explanation, which is the category of no explanation, suggests that, well, lots of people do weird things and cultures have strange beliefs, so there no, may well be no explanation. This is just a weird Mediterranean behavior, and we've grown out of that kind of thing, thank goodness. Um, there's a problem here as well, though. It wasn't just the Greeks who did this kind of thing. In fact, all ancient cultures for which we have evidence, from the southern tip of Africa to northern Britannia and from eastern to western Eurasia, were in the habit when they ran up against the limits of their rational thinking to turning to techniques that took over for them and allowed them to advance their problems. The techniques vary. Uh, the Chinese took tortoise shells and put them in fire and then read the cracks that happened afterwards. But the structure of thinking is the same. If we're going to propose that this is some kind of mass delusion, we'd need some explanation for why the mass delusion is so consistent across human cultures that have functionally nothing to do with one another in many different areas of the world. Superstition is a very weak answer. Now, in my work on the arcane past, things took um, uh, the most important turn for me uh, when I uh, took a brief tour into the present time, a time I don't spend that much time in, and it's strange and <laughs> strange and bizarre for me. I spent a year with a team of researchers at the Center for Advanced Study and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. This is mainly a group of cognitive scientists evolutionary biologists and behavioral psychologists who are pushing the envelope of understanding of the complexities of our cognitive lives. Most of us, and I surely at the time, have a standard picture of how our brains work. We set out on a problem, we direct our awareness to it, we self-consciously gather facts and using logical rules, we draw inferences, we reach conclusions that then motivate our actions. Let's call this discursive thinking. But this is only part of the story. The researchers at the center were expanding this view and opening up fields that I would call non-discursive thinking, things that don't quite answer to that description of the way our brains work. And some of the pieces that they were coming on were ringing bells for me, struck me as very familiar. One scholar was working on face-to-face -face conversations. He looked at how we continuously and unselfconsciously process nonverbal cues in our conversation partners, and that these shape the top-level thinking that emerges from such events. The oracular consultation was famously interactive, the bell is ringing in my head, and someone even without a knowledge base may well discern from just seeing how a person reacts to different suggestions what the most useful one is going to be in a particular situation. Another kind of scientist was studying the phenomena of thin slicing. This is a, a, a claim that our snap judgments are sometimes as good and for some things better than our most careful deliberative processes. The examination, examination of entrails instantly came to mind for me. In situations like this, often in the heat of battle, where debate is coursing around from many different uh, uh, pieces, uh, taking into account many different pieces of information, the cutting open of, of, of a live animal, usually a large one, has a way of focusing people's attention. And focusing on the splayed innards of another animal interrupts the conversation. While the diviner is staring at that, it's imagined the diviner comes up with a snap judgment not a considered decision. And while rule books for such things were legendary in antiquity, none of them survive. And I think none of them ever existed. It's not about applying rules to a particular situation. It's about making a snap judgment in the heat of the moment. There were also scholars at the center who were working at the, uh, laying out the strong gains that people accrue when they're dealing with complex problems after they've been grinding it out for a while to set their attention on something else for a while and allow their non-conscious minds to advance the problem. Their non-conscious minds have power and can advance the problem. When they return to it later, things look different and clearer than they did before. Nearly all the techniques of antiquity did this kind of a thing. As an historian of ideas, this got me to thinking, discursively, I think. And I was interested now in looking at non-discursive thinking historically. Over time, uh, there are different manifestations of this. In the contemporary period, we usually, in polite company anyway, we use the term intuition to describe these things. Uh, we may well refer to the famous phrase of Malcolm Gladwell, thinking without thinking. A century and a half ago, in the wake of Darwin, in the middle of the 19th century, when physiology was the queen of the sciences, there was a different way of talking about it. These scientists were fascinated by the reflex action that they could observe in the musculature 
musculature of our bodies, and they proposed that there were congruent kinds of actions happening in our thinking. They called this unconscious cerebration. Two centuries before that, the English poet John Milton has the archangel Raphael explain to Adam in the Garden of Eden that the creatures of the universe think in two different ways. There is discursive thinking, which is what humans mostly do, and then he says there's something else called intuition, which is mostly the way angels think. On occasion, humans get a chance to think like angels, but it happens rarely. This opened up a whole new vantage on Greek divination for me. It started to look less like an outlier and more like the tale of a long and consistent arc of human cognitive history that attested to a core human experience. We oftentimes find ourselves in a situation of knowing things without knowing quite how we know them. This led me to propose an axiom. Here's my axiom. Our ability to know exceeds our capacity to understand that ability. Let me repeat. Our ability to know exceeds our capacity to understand that ability. And if it's true, it, as an axiom, it held in the past, it holds good now, and even despite the ingenious work of our cognitive scientists, it will hold into the future. We will remain to some degree mysterious to ourselves. The axiom tells us that there will be surplus knowledge. Surplus knowledge is provocative, it provokes some accounting for it, and by the axiom, that accounting won't be exactly right, but that accounting needs to be culturally useful. So back to the ancient world, I gained a different kind of perspective on what they were up to after spending time with these cognitive scientists. When they took time out of their deliberative thinking to change focus on a puzzling riddle, cracks in a tortoise shell, or the erratic, erratic flight paths or screeches of a bird, they were engaging in their own local variant of the culturally authorized techniques for opening a space for non-discursive thinking to happen. This was not an example, mainly, of them engaging in exotic theological commitments because of superstitious brains. It was not an example of them trying to man manipulate the masses with ostentatious mystery. That's not why they did this. They did this because it worked. Our non-conscious brain has power, and they had ways of putting it to use. And finishing back up into the present time, my claim that you do this kind of thing? Well, whenever you're facing a multivariable question with a, over a complex data set in a situation you really care about and you need to take a break, chances are you probably do something. You clean your desk. You take a walk. You take a shower. You sleep on it. These are our cultures, authorized forms for opening up a break in discursive thinking and allowing our unselfconscious, non-discursive mind to take over for a while. According to our best authorities today, this improves our chances of making headway. And according to the authorities from antiquity, whom I must say I trust a little bit more, you should definitely do this. You may well defeat a great empire. Thank you. <laughs>